Good day. Uh, welcome to our time together here on this Sunday. Whether you're watching it um, on the day or down the week, it's good to have you with us. And I trust that today will be a great impartation into your spiritual walk as you become more and more like your true self, created in the image of God, uh, in the image of Christ Jesus. Uh, we are busy with Lent. And uh, we're in this season, we're trialing a few different things. And so we have our in-person gatherings at Arana Hills and then Zilmir in those locations, and then also online. And so this is a very special segment uh, from last week, this week, and the next couple of weeks. We're going to be speaking directly to you, wherever you are. And uh, we trust that this season of formation would really guide us into Easter in deep and profound ways. At times difficult, but I believe that there'll be great experiences, great fruit from our time together today. A couple of things that you need to be aware of. If you are in Brisbane, if you live close by and you join our, our gatherings from time to time, we have a men's breakfast next Saturday. You can check out our newsletter uh, or just online and you'll find some details to register for that. We also just want to thank those that give regularly um, to us. It makes a difference. It is the way that we do what we do, uh, not just in our congregation, but also in our community. And I want to thank you for, do that, for doing that. If you want to do that and start again to do that, you can find details for that online. Lent is about formation. It's a journey for us uh, similar to that of Jesus as he entered the desert for 40 days. We do so, we do these rhythms, these exercises to help condition our mind to the reality of God's closeness, his character, his plan for our lives. We also don't do this on our own. We do this in the context of community. In fact, you can't be a Christian on your own. It is a communal thing. And it's very important to understand that. And so as we've been having these conversations, we've been feeling that God's been speaking to us out of Matthew 13 about the good soil, being prepared for the good seed that then falls over the Easter season. The good soil is a picture of our lives. It is the reality of what's happening down there. We're so used to surface level living where we get used to pretending that things are fine or we ignore the things that we're very aware of that are there in our lives. I believe that this Lent season is a time for us to take things away. It is a time for us to do a bit of a, a, a check on our lives, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually, um, but to face the reality of what's there. And the good news is, is that God doesn't just expect us to go down there on our own. He is there already. God is in the midst of your pain and your trauma and your history and your story and your reality. And he's inviting you to enter that space with him, to see healing, to see breakthrough, to see restoration, and that might take some time. It is a time for us, Lent, where we give up. We give up. We fast things in our life. And if you follow our little study guide, you will see that we have suggested some fasts every week. This week, we're fasting social media and the internet, and some of you might choose to do that the whole week, Others might choose to do so day by day. I encourage you to do so because these things fill the space of our life and it actually dilutes the ability for us to focus on God and His Word and His presence in our lives. And so we are doing the same. It is not just a time of giving up, it's also a time of giving in. And so we pray. We spend time in prayer. Uh, we pray because pray forms us. Prayer is a formation process. It is not just there for our little shopping list to God of the things that we need, or the things that we need him to do. In fact, he knows all those things already. But it's, it's space that we create to listen to God, to ask him questions. Maybe just to ask him, Lord, help me understand what's happening at the moment. Help me to discover my true self. Help me to identify my false self. Maybe let's just pray in this moment as we talk about that and we also want to pray for a local church as we have been doing the last couple of weeks join us for that lord we just thank you that as we pray we give up things that creates room we give in meaning we just sit with you it's space for us lord may your spirit fill us lord may we experience the closeness of your presence 
And because that happens, we have a heart for others. We can't help ourselves. And so we pray. We pray for our brothers and sisters this week in Samford Uniting Church and Pastor Matt and his team. Lord, we pray that they are blessed, that they know you deeper this week. Thank you, Lord, that this morning they are singing praises to you. They are speaking about Jesus. Lord, they are honoring your presence. And we ask, Lord, for favor on that church as they enter this new season with a new leadership and so forth. And we, we pray for their blessing because if they are blessed, we are blessed. Um, and we stand with them this morning. Amen. The other thing that we do over this season of good soil and Lent is, uh, apart from giving up fasting, giving in uh, prayer, we also give out. It's about generosity. <laughs> generosity is part of our design. And uh, we want to give people an opportunity to be generous in the way that they are capable, in line with the, the well-being of, um, and the health of their own finances. This week, we want to place a particular focus on the work that we physically do here in our local community. Uh, some of you might know that we support families from time to time that are referred to us through our chaplaincy network or external services. They often just come and knock on our door in the daytime and look for assistance, look for food, look for bills to be covered. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of requests for fuel as some of these single moms with children uh, the majority of them who approach us just don't have the capacity to get around and it really limits their capacity to parent and to have hope for the, for the short term future. So maybe if you're called to give into that space, you can give and then market community and it'll go there directly. It's a way for us to exercise giving out, which is part of Lent. I want to do a Lenten prayer before we create space for Sam that'll share a reflection with us today. God, Heavenly Father, look upon me and hear my prayer during this holy season of Lent. You inspire me. You inspire us. Help us to lean in and be renewed in action and spirit. Without you, we can do nothing. By your spirit, help us to know your way and to be eager in doing your will. Teach us to find new life through confession, repentance, and surrender. Help us live by your commandment of love. And God of love, bring us back to an awareness of you. Send your spirit to make us strong and active in faith. As we confess, repent, and surrender, open our hearts to your love and prepare us for the coming feast of the resurrection of Jesus. Lord, during this Lenten season, nourish us with your word of life and make us one with you in love and prayer. Fill our hearts with your love. And keep us faithful to the gospel of Christ. Give us grace to in times of human weakness. Father of love, source of all blessings, help us to pass from life as we knew it into the new life of grace. Prepare us for the glory of your kingdom, Lord. I ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. One God forever. Amen. Thank you, Sam. Hello, everyone. It is uh, great to be able to share this reflection with you today. And so I hope that as we go through this, as these are just some of my thoughts and what's come to mind for me, that, that God would be revealing more of himself to you in what, in what you're thinking and what, how you process this. And so that's my prayer for us today. We're going to Luke uh, chapter 9 from verse 18 to 27. Let's read that now. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And as he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah and others that of one of the prophets of, of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, 
Let them deny themselves and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when it comes to his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. A lot in this scripture, a lot in this passage. And so I'm just going to touch on a few things that came to mind for me as I was reading. And it really does relate back to what we've talked about for the last few weeks. Confession, repentance, and surrender. The first thing that stands out is people misunderstood who Jesus was. As he was asking the people around him, who do they say that I am? They said all these other people. I think how you view someone causes a lot. It not only says a lot inside you, but it causes a lot in how you respond or react. And so maybe it's preconceived ideas, maybe it's judgments or awkwardness, or you put them in a box. So how does that, how does doing that change the way that we accept or receive what that person has for us? A few things come to mind, particularly in the awkwardness uh, stage. Um, Just a couple of stories for you. Um, I was coordinating this fundraising dinner. Um, So I did send out all the invites, was doing the RSVPs, and um, I obviously invite some politicians along, but they couldn't make it, and so they sent some delegates. Um, And so there was two names that I didn't know, Um, one from one party and one from the other. And I remember one lady arriving, and I was like, hi, how's it going? And we were chatting for a second. I'm like, you must be, and said the name of the person from the other party who she wasn't. And she was lovely about it. Like she was, she was so lovely, but getting it wrong in that moment, I was like, oh no, this is crazy. Another story that I think of is I'm a school chaplain and um, I was at a PNC meeting. Our PNC uh, support our chaplaincy service so much. They're so, so supportive of, of what we do and both financially and um, giving us opportunities in the school. And so I like to go along to these, uh, to PNC meetings throughout the year just to say hey and tell them a bit about what we're doing. And um, they had just had their AGM, so it was a whole new leadership that was there. Um, And so I went and I met this guy and we were talking for a while and um, yeah, just chatting about our lives like outside of, of our connection with school. And then I was like, oh, so like, so what, what's your role here? And he's like, oh, I'm the president. Oh, it was so awkward. Because <laughs> I was, oh, I should have known that. Like I should have known who he was and that would have changed so much in how I was speaking to him. Not that I didn't speak to him like I would any, anyone else. Like I think we, were, we had a great conversation, but I think there was something that was missed by honoring him in, in, in who he was. And so... There are a couple of stories that come to mind because I think when we think back to what Jesus is just saying, I think it's so uh, easy for people to miss maybe the direction or the purpose or the blessing of what he was trying to communicate, what he was trying to show because they didn't realize who he was. To me, that's a shame, you know? But he goes on to say, and he strictly charged them and commanded them to tell this to no one, to tell who he was to no one. He didn't even want them to know, and that's a mystery to me. I don't know. I don't know why that is. I think it might have something to do with um, God having perfect timing and, and seeing the best way in which the blessing of Jesus would be poured out to the people around them, and, you know, maybe something like that. I don't know. But to me, that's a mystery. Why wouldn't we want to want people to know who he was and so that this blessing could flow through their community. But we today live in a day where we are aware of who Jesus is. Confessing purpose, his, confessing personally who he is. 
confessing with our lives and in where we are. Confession of his name today. Because we're in a different time to when this is talking about. We're in a time where he is known. We need to confess who he is today. The next part, I think I get this passage wrong. I know I have in the past, wrong in my, in my mind so often because I've thought that denying himself, the part where it talks about denying himself, was exactly the same as taking up his cross. I don't think it is. I immediately go to the denying part and I think, what is he asking us to deny? And again, I probably often jump to the extreme. I probably go to the, to, the, to the extent and denying who I am, my identity. But I don't know if that's what he's saying. I don't, know if he's, I don't know if that's what he wants us to take away from this. Because I think that he wants us to slowly uncover our identity all throughout our life when we're with him. Because that's established with God. That's established by him And that doesn't change. So what is he saying? It could definitely mean that we need to deny our false self. This self that doesn't really exist. Denying the self that we think is right. Not who God says that I am. Deny that we know it all. And we leave out God from the mix completely. Deny that we have the right way. Maybe it's denying our selfishness. Maybe it's denying our selfishness rather than our identity as created beings who live with Christ and his spirit today. My next thought is that if we're denying something, what does this open us up to? Because I find that denying things is only part of the solution. It can only get you so far. And uh, the next question is, but what are you taking up? And Jesus puts this so well and he lays it out for us. The cross. That is what we need to pick up. The cross. There is something to fill the space that denying leaves. And it is the cross. It's not religion. It's not only the death of Jesus, but it's his life and resurrection that point to his spirit that we are taking up today. If we take him up, all of him, life, identity will flow out of that place. Repentance, an acknowledgement of the direction I'm facing and with what I'm facing with so that Jesus can fill the gap that he can fill that void. This is what it causes. Now, I'm not here to tell you what this denying part means for you, but what I can encourage you to do is to abide in him, to stay close to him and have him as your source of life and truth. Because what it says in in John chapter 15, from verse four to five, says, remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This inter- interweaving connection between the vine and the branches is, is so beautiful and I think one that we can often overlook and miss. So my encouragement to you today is to abide in him. Abide in him. Allow him to take you on a journey of understanding of our true selves in him, created, loved, graced, because what flows from that place might not be what we have planned, but it will be abundantly more fulfilling. Sure, we might see this as a cost. 
Yes, there might be tough decisions to be made along the way of this uncovering. It might cost us something, but is it really a cost if it's fulfilling? Confession, repentance, surrender. There's some thoughts as we've unpacked this verse from Luke. I just encourage you to sit with him today and consider what comes to mind for you when you think about these things. Not only denying, but what are you picking up? What's the life that he wants to give you from that place? Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Sam. Um, Maybe a question that we can ask ourselves when we listen to these reflections is what is the text saying to us? What is it saying to you? Yes, it has historical context. Yes, we can go into the depth of the Greek in the New Testament or the Hebrew in the Old Testament. But what is the text saying to you? We believe in a living God that is with us, that is present. And what is the great spirit whispering to you in these moments when you read the text? You see, um, it is the written word, but it's also the living word that resides within you. And it brings through the spirit all things to remembrance. Isn't that an incredible mystery? How all things reside in you because God is in you. And when you center yourself on him, there is these revelations that come forth. I believe it's powerful when we do that. Um, we're going to take communion together. And uh, may you get the elements if you don't have them ready with you. If you're not ready to do so, we're going to take communion. But before we do that, may you just write down in the comment section there if you have any particular prayer requests um, before we finish or even afterwards. Uh, we want to pray for people specifically. And if you are online community, some of whom we've never actually even met in person, um, we can pray for those things. We can engage with you. We can catch up during the week on Zoom or FaceTime or on the phone. If you have a particular prayer request, we really do want to speak to that. Uh, If you have any thoughts on the reflections, why don't you put them down there as well? You know, God might actually be speaking through your thought um, in the comment section more than the reflection or me. Uh, Most probably that's the case. So I want to encourage you. Um, This is a medium that God has gifted us with and we want to continue and grow in its use. Uh, I want to read a particular passage out of Colossians and I'm just flicking to my notes here. It's a little bit easier for me to do and I want to invite you. Colossians 3 verse 1 to 4. Let's read that together. He is your life. So if you're serious, this is out of the message translation, if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up, look up, and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead and it's dying through Lent. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. That's good news. He is your life. When Christ, your real life, remember, shows up again on this earth, you'll show up too. The real you, the glorious you. And then I love this. It says, meanwhile, (laughs) be content with obscurity like Christ. Be content with obscurity like Christ. It's this now, not yet. It's having a heavenly mind. It says, uh, position, relocate your mind to heaven. It's not that we're not on earth. It's just that we have the mind of Christ, that we think heavenly thoughts, that we think more of ourselves, not more often, but more highly. He says, 
think like God because God has given you this incredible revelation in Jesus of his opinion. He says, change your opinion to his opinion. Move from death to life. Relocate yourself. And then also, (laughs) just be aware that you're still here. Be content with the fact that we're seated in heavenly places, but we are here to do earthly good. It's in this practice of communion that something strange, miraculous, mysterious, we can do this very simple, ordinary practice. It earths us. Although we are created for eternity in heaven, that's where we are seated in Jesus. This earths us in, God's, in Jesus' blood and Jesus' body that was broken for me and you. When you take this, you settle in the midst of your trauma and your pain and your reality and you say, Lord, give me a divine perspective. Help me relocate mentally. Yes, I'm struggling with this particular health issue. I know there are people watching on here. I know exactly uh, where you're at, some of you, and others I have an idea of some of the conditions that you're struggling with. Can I just say, that, that it, is, it is God's plan for you to know that he is with you in the midst of your chaos. I pray that you are released from that. I pray that you are set free from that. And, and, and I know it wasn't God's plan to send this calamity your way, but you know what? He is with you in the midst of your obscurity. I hope that that liberates you. I hope that that gives you some sense of peace to know that, you know, I'm not alone in this. God is not sent to test me. God is with me in the pain, and he's going to be with me as I move through it. Let's pray together and then have communion. Father, thank you that we are in you and that you are in us. And thank you, Lord, that while we are here on earth facing uncertainty, facing struggle, facing tension, facing this journey of becoming our true selves, there's there's this whole time of shedding, of letting go across Lent. There's this lament, there's the grief, there's all that, Lord. We're going down there, and yet you are not leaving us or forsaking us. You're already there. And we can go in there, we can enter it with boldness and with some sort of expectation that, Lord, it will be be better because the God of heaven and earth is with us. We know this because of the records and text and scripture, because of the tradition of the church and because of faith that resides within us. Father, I pray that we can take this and I pray that it shifts us, transforms us, heals us, restores us as only your spirit can. Amen. Let's have communion together. I would now like to uh, read a benediction. Um, and finish our time here today. A benediction is simply a blessing, uh, and I want to speak it over you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, pray that your, that your week is good, that you are surrounded by good people. If things come to the surface that you struggle to deal with, may you reach out. We are here, and uh, hopefully you know some good folks that can stand by. I want to bless you. Maybe just open your hands in a posture of receiving that which God has for you. May God the Father who does not despise the hurting spirit give you a soft and a full heart. May Christ who lived, died, and rose again heal you by his wounds. May the Holy Spirit who leads us in all truth speak to you words of grace and peace. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Be blessed.